Good afternoon, Team Krulak community, and welcome back to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole on the Russia-Ukraine War. Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center, here is your host as always, and we welcome back Dr. Yuval Weber, our Russia subject matter expert, to update us on the, the latest developments. And as it happens, we, uh, you know, looking back on the, the timing of some of our episodes, sometimes it seemed to be about 24 hours out from, from talking about something and then a, a really big development happening right after we've wrapped up. So for those who remember from the last episode, the uh, Russian military had, they had just announced that they were going to withdraw from the Kherson region, which has been a point of contention for months now uh, along the Dnieper River. And our discussion last time was sort of, look, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what shape that withdrawal would take, whether it was going to be a panicked retreat, whether this might have been some sort of deception operation to to bring in Ukrainian forces for a you know, hard, bloody, destructive fight in the, the city of Kherson itself, some combination or some other alternative. But as it happened, uh, I think it was about 24 hours after we had that rabbit hole episode out with that discussion that uh, they they were largely gone. Um, and there was no no destructive battle in Kherson city itself. Um, Ukrainian soft, I think, were the first in. And then within a couple of days of that, you had President Zelensky, you know, going down in person to go visit and and, uh, you know, and look, talk to the populace. And, you know, there were lots of videos of, of flag raisings as well as what, what's been a, a uh, um, sort of a repeated pattern as, you know, Ukrainian military, you know, liberates their home villages. They come across their own family members who they've, you know, who they've liberated and you have all these reunions. So um, anyway, so that's, so that, that's what actually happened. So um, you if you want to take us through, you know, uh, was, uh, was this, was this, the shape this withdrawal took was that uh, was that surprising to you? Is that what you expected? Um, and then what what does it indicate, sort of more largely, about if this was something that the Russian forces were in fact preparing for a long time? As well as we talked about last time, you know, do you do you build a golden bridge for your opponent to withdraw over so that you you avoid a a harder fight than you want to have? Um, you know, whether they're that. They have the Russians might have been allowed to retreat unmolested just so they could be just so they could leave, just get them out of there. So great. So once again, wonderful to be on with you. Um, so certainly we in essence, when we think about the timeline and the, the different scenarios uh, and, the, and the questions that you raised, the the current general in charge of the overall war, um, his name is Suda Vikin, um, when he was appointed to, to his position, one, it was noticeable, it was noted, notable because he was the first general under the level of Gerasimov, the, the chair of the general staff over there, the equivalent to Mark Milley, um, that he was the first person who took responsibility for everything. And prior to that, that was one of the things that was really bringing the Russian invasion effort um, to basically its unsatisfying um, results uh, was that they were basically running several different mini wars at once. So finally, some guy is appointed to take overall uh, command. When he was appointed, his very first series of interviews, he spoke very explicitly about difficult decisions that need to be taken and difficult choices that are ahead. And it was suggested at that time and it became clear over the course of like the following month that the difficult decision was he probably didn't take the job unless it was to withdraw from Kherson because it became clear that given that Kherson is on one side of the Dnieper River and the lines of uh, communication, the supply lines are on the other side of the river, that unless Russia is able to move forward from Kherson, either in the northern direction or in a western direction, that those troops were not long for that city. And that this was the big thing that Russia had conquered at the beginning of the war, not through combat, but through uh, an intelligence operation. By turning in enough local elites from the Ukrainian to the Russian side, they were able to take Kherson uh, without a fight, uh, or without a significant fight, I should say. And so they had tried to make Kherson basically the showpiece of Russia in Ukraine. You know, it's the only major, um, it's the only provincial capital they are able to take. And over the course of eight months, um, it didn't work. So Sudovikin was brought in ostensibly to affect what was the least panicked withdrawal possible. And so over the course of then the following month, they then moved considerable amount of their equipment out. 
they move uh, most of their experienced troops out and replace them with basically mobilized um, mobilized soldiers, you know, just in effect walking bags of meat, um, you know, from the Russian perspective. And once it became clear that Kherson itself was un undefendable in the sense of the Ukrainian army coming closer and closer, that's when they had their last withdrawal. And to a large extent, they, um, the Ukrainians didn't try to go after them in terms of, you know, slowing them down. The Russians have gone to the other side. And then, as you put it, the Ukrainians were able to take uh, Kherson city back peacefully. And it was notable that over the course of the, you know, eight, nine months of the conflict so far, even though, and uh, the annexation, I, I should look, I should have looked for when this date was, the annexation was roughly two months ago. Putin obviously didn't go visit, you know, brand new Russian city, uh, brand new Russian uh, region. And within a couple days, even with the Russians just a couple miles away, uh, Zelensky went and visited the town in order to, you know, bring the world's attention to, to Ukraine victory. But as he put it, to basically buck up the spirits of the people of Kherson. Um, they've been living under occupation for eight, nine months. They um, have not been treated well by the, the, by the Russians, and they certainly don't have very much in the way of electricity. So just going down there to say, like, I'm here, I care, let me listen to your problems, again, exhibits Zelensky's so far very good, you know, information component to the, to the conflict, which is just being visible and listening, demonstrating competence, demonstrating caring. And that basically wrapped up, in essence, the occupation and then liberation of Kherson city. Yeah, so, and so to expand on that, some of that last uh, couple of points there is, you know, so when when Ukrainian forces went in and President Zelensky visited, and obviously the city, it avoided a potentially destructive urban fight that, you know, could have reduced it down to its, you know, to the, uh, you know, to, to bricks and, and house frames. Um, mm -hmm. So that that didn't happen, um, you know, but as, as you sort of intimated, conditions are still not great. So with the Russians gone, um, what did we what, what did we find? What was um, what what became visible when um, you know friendly troops were able to get back in there? So so far they found a you know few basically like underground prisons, um, and to a large extent, the fact that really besides for the Russians uh, stealing a bunch of things, and if we may take just a detour for one second here, one of the things that is the Perhaps one of the strangest subplots of this entire conflict is on their way out of Kherson, the Russians stole a raccoon. And you might think to yourself, what does a raccoon have to do with this war? And my answer as a, a subject matter expert on Russian military and political strategy is, I have no idea. I have no idea what the significance of this one particular raccoon was, but I watched the video. And basically these Russian soldiers made their own like animal carrier, like a wooden box with like a metal grate on it, took the raccoon, put into their own carrier, and then left. And the Ukrainian public has now started a petition to Z President Zelensky to exchange the statue of Catherine the Great in Odessa for this particular raccoon. Um, it's been called Saving Private Raccoon. So it's just, we know throughout the conflict, the Russian, like Russian soldiers have stolen like washing machines and other electronics, which sort of points to the poverty, like, you know, in the places where they're from. They're even when retreating from a town, whether they've committed human rights violations or not, they take all the things of value. That's sort of understood. Looting has a long history in the in the history of conflict. I've never heard of a pre-planned raccoon theft. No idea what this means. But for our listeners, you need to know the Russians are now stealing raccoons. And yeah, and this we 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 may never know um, the why behind this. And it just um, it's interesting how even in, you know, what some have called, in, you know, the most, you know, the most in in informatized or information saturated, you know, conflict that we've seen yet in the 21st century. Weird stuff still happens and you just don't know why. 
and there's no it just no no sense to it it just it happens and uh i don't know maybe maybe we'll find out later maybe not it's just you know but not everything has an explanation you know i i did see uh a Finnish person um, wrote online that in Finnish language, and I have no way to to, to fact check this because I don't speak Finnish. Uh, maybe our Finnish uh, viewers or listeners uh, can can verify this. But apparently, raccoon is translated as washing bear in in that language. So the person was saying perhaps that was where the the soldiers had uh, some confusion on the subject. You know, interesting. As you say that, that reminds me that there have been past instances in. I think more on the the Russian intelligence side, but where uh, they have taken some very literal interpretations of the orders they were given. And I'm trying to remember there was one, you know, one of these instances where they, you know, Russian intelligence, you know, found, you know, like a saboteur or a wrecker from Ukraine, and they took pictures of the things they would find in the apartment, which, you know, Russian intelligence clearly planted there. But I have this distinct memory of one instance where yes. you found copies of a computer game because yes. yes, they found copies of the computer game, The Sims. Yes. And it was clear that someone didn't understand the difference between like a SIM card and your cell phone and just like the game Sims. So apparently, it, and it was when the, I think that when the Ukrainians were doing, you know, various, the Ukrainians were alleged to be doing various sabotage things in Russia that they would bring a computer game with them. Yeah, so again, if it's, if it's the washing bear, then maybe, this is another one of those extremely literal interpretations of orders that uh, just, you know, it, it may have, it may have made sense to somebody in the at the time, the way it was phrased. It just doesn't make sense to us. But it, as you said, that this this would actually not be the first time a, a, a Russian um, subordinate has taken out and done a very literal interpretation of an order they've been given. So weird. It's so weird to steal a raccoon. I have no idea. Like. Well, we, we could discuss like the the meaning of raccoon theft, I think until we're, we're very old, but we just have to say the Russians stole a raccoon and that's all we can say about it. Yeah, and, and I accept there are some things in life I will never understand, and this is probably gonna be one of them. Um, so we're, uh, I wanna shift up north here because, so, you know, 24 hours after we did that last episode, we had the, you know, and no kidding withdrawal from her son and and looked at how it unfolded um we're actually i think now 24 hours inside of a, a more recent development which was uh over the last so to wind back um i think it was about 48 hours ago uh, roughly two days you know where what seemed like you know the worst possible um consequence of this war may have may have finally happened because it's been sort of a, a fear that the war would spill out over the borders of Ukraine into other countries, many of which are members of NATO and all the implications thereof. So there was a report that a like a missile had landed in Poland just inside the, the eastern Polish border outside the, our border with Ukraine. You know, fortunately, two Polish citizens were killed in the explosion. And uh, the first reaction was Oh crap! A Russian missile went into a NATO country. What, oh, what do we like? What does this mean? What do we do now? And obviously, you know, the uh, the response from the Polish government initially uh, very strong and condemnatory, and from some of the Eastern Eastern European um, NATO members, the you know the Baltic states especially, who have, who have all been on you know probably on a that the tensions have been high that this thing would happen that this would spill over their borders, and with the promise that we're going to defend every inch of NATO territory, right? What, okay. Now that day has come, what, what do we, what does NATO do now? And there was talk of, you know, getting, uh, invoking article four potentially. And then as the story came out, it seemed, uh, it was not a Russian missile, but actually a, a Ukrainian air defense missile that either, you know, on destroying or attempting to intercept a Russian missile got deflected somehow and wound up in Poland or may have just missed. And you know, unfortunately, landed in the wrong place and and killed innocent people. Um, but but with this, the uh, we it's developed into sort of a kind of a, a fissure in the messaging between um, two of the you know between the Ukrainians on the on the one hand and specifically President Zelensky, um, and then the NATO leadership on the other hand. Um, 
as we were talking about before, sort of seems to have developed an almost to sort of an unforced messaging error here on the part of the Ukrainians, uh, because whether it was a Russian missile or Ukrainian missile, like no, nobody's going to tell Ukraine you can't attempt to intercept missiles. And if Russia hadn't been firing, you know, close to 100 missiles in the first place, never would happen. Um, but if you want, want to maybe walk us through like where where this sort of fissure is coming and and where both sides sort of stand right now in terms of the, the message that they're sending. So, so certainly, um, you know, as you put it, like, clearly, in terms of what happened, and then the interpretations thereof, uh, as you just put it, Russians fire missiles into Ukraine, and Ukraine either one deflects or one misses, ha falls in Poland, not not a crazy sort of sequence of events. So immediately, there was let's say consternation slash alarm slash from, you know, from some people, you know, the see, I told you so Russia is going to attack um, a, a NATO member. And this is actually a great point to dwell upon in terms of cognitive biases. So we have seen numerous times, not just like over the course of this conflict, but just, you know, watching Russia for years when the news is against them and, you know, having to withdraw from Kherson when the news is against them, they often take that that moment to escalate further in order to then redefine or reframe the conversation around their capabilities and the threat that they pose rather than whatever setback they just endured. So within the context of Kherson um, being abandoned back to, uh, to Ukraine, the missile falls into Poland and then people think, ah, yes, Russia's doing badly on the battlefield. Therefore, they need to reframe this conversation and therefore, something that isn't like a direct attack, because that obviously escalates super quickly, but in terms of demonstrating to NATO what Russia is still capable of doing, that's an easy sort of sequence of, of thoughts. And that's basically where, obviously, Zelensky then took the ball and ran with it, saying, this is the Russian attack. We've been defending NATO and the rest of the world against Russia. This is time for basically like NATO and Europe to do something about it. And then, you know, is it an Article 5? And Article 5 uh, calls for, you know, the concerted efforts of the NATO members to, one, they need to take this issue to the United Nations uh, Security Council. That's what's, um, that's what's directly stated in the Article 5 text, but to then think about what self-defense could be. Then Article 4, talking about, um, you know, a member calling for consultations with other NATO states, its partners, in order to um, uh, seek per perhaps just consultations on its territorial integrity, its sovereignty, things of that nature. That's in essence where Zelensky wanted this to go. Obviously, the Poles are very upset because like, if missiles are falling on their territory, they need to do something about it. So they had emergency meetings of their, um, their defense and national security councils. And then NATO obviously became very concerned about it. So they all got together and then they investigated. And then they figured out that this is unlikely to be a missile fired from Russia. And we were talking before we started uh, recording and you noted that in terms of both Poland, NATO writ large, they've been probably tracking with radar and other, you know, uh, technical means with terms of satellite, they've been They've been tracking basically everything that goes into the air over this entire region throughout the duration of this conflict. And they probably figured out pretty quickly, this wasn't a Russian attack. So here's where we can then think about like the possible outcomes. The first and foremost, as you started, this is an issue of air defense. Russia is going to be firing missiles into Ukraine and that civilian infrastructure until this war is over. And in fact, just today, Dmitry Peskov, the press spokesperson of the Russian president, said that Russia is going to attack um, Ukraine's energy infrastructure until Ukraine surrenders. So the Russians are going to do what they're going to do. There's no real negoti negotiating with them. What Zelensky did is he just doubled down. And as we were uh, discussing ahead of time, and as you said, if he had just said, you know, at the be you know, within a couple hours, you know what? We've looked, we thought it was the Russians. Turns out it was one of ours. You know, we apologize unreservedly. These things happen. If the Russians had been firing at us, this would have never happened. And that would have basically been a very easy segue to say, yes, we made 
we said the Russians did it, turned out to be us, and um, we apologize. I had also, and you know, when thinking about that, in 2020, um, after the United States uh, killed uh, Qasem Soleimani of Iran, the Iranians in that general, like, crazy tumultuous period actually shot down a civilian jetliner, and which happened to just be randomly enough, a Ukrainian one. At first they came up with a crazy story and then they admitted it was them. Tragedy, but everyone just moved on because they took responsibility. Zelensky kept doubling down probably in order to save the embarrassment of all the people up and down the chain who told them it was the Russians to not look weak in front of the domestic audience, but at the cost of eroding his international credibility, which he has spent eight, nine months building to a very high level. Again, like this with better air defense, this situation wouldn't have happened, but here we are. The Russians for their part have just been overjoyed. Uh, perhaps jubilation would be a great way to describe the vibes on like the Russian talk shows. Because one, it's certainly re just Kherson, who she don't know her. Um, no one's talking about Kherson to the extent that they were, you know, just a couple hours before then. And this, you know, like even on like public opinion in Russia, only 9% of Russians in, um, in September were talking that it was important to have Kherson and only 6% in October. So like Kherson itself is not that salient amongst like the general population but it is really important for basically people who watch talk shows and people on talk shows. Russian news media used to tell like in the weather report, the weather in Kherson as well. They no longer do that. So they're able to move past that humiliation and then basically say, and even move past the fact that they were attacking civilian infrastructure in Ukraine to just focus in on this effect unforced error of basically Zelensky and the people around him. And so that's been really great for the Russians to talk about the missteps of others rather than what they've been doing. And just today, when thinking about, you know, the issues of missiles and airplanes, the MH17 verdict of when the Russians uh, shot down a Dutch airliner uh, eight years ago, that verdict came down today, holding the, the three Russian commanders um, responsible for giving the orders to shoot down planes. And so we see in different instances, mistakes happen in conflict. People can also take responsibility for those mistakes or they can double down and keep going at it forever and ever, never admitting their mistake and eroding their credibility. And that's where basically like we have an example from the Russians, an example from the Iranians, and we'll see basically whether over the course of the next couple of days or weeks, um, whether Zelensky can, starts and then continues uh, to walk back um, the charges that it was the Russians who were responsible, if in, if indeed it was the case that Ukraine was responsible. Yeah, you know, so and you know, definitely something to watch because a uh, you know, as as unforced errors go, like don't want to oversimplify it, but it's you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you, right? And y Ukraine's we've talked about this before, right? Like Ukraine survives on two things: it's you know the fight, the its soldiers staying in the fight, it's and its civilians not quitting. And Western aid and starting to throw, you know, point fingers or throw darts where, you know, at those uh, those same beneficiaries that you need to keep your soldiers in the fight and your, you know, and engage the will of your citizens. It's, uh, you know, not, it's different from the, you know, this, the information campaign that we've seen thus far. And, you know, I, I don't know what that reflects, you know, whether it's something as simple as, you know, he's trying to back his military chain of command because that's important domestically. Or, you know, after after several months of, uh, of, you know, trying to, you know, sustain a message and sustain willpower and all these stuff. I mean, people make mistakes over time, right? Like nobody's nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. And um, there they may have been other. You know, I'm, in fact, I'm sure there are other mistakes or errors that, um, you know, have come out from the Ukrainian side and they just maybe haven't caught the headlines as much, you know, but injecting injecting a a friction point against the people you need most is uh not successful not not successful information messaging um and especially again you know it's one thing against the united states but you know the poland and the eastern nato countries like latvia lithuania and estonia you know, have, have been among the most the strongest supporters 
right, for arming Ukraine and keeping them in the fight. So um, probably want to stay friends with those folks because they've been your strongest friends up to now. And yes, and I, I should mention that uh, I just looked up. So uh, Zelensky has started to walk this back. Um, it, it said, and this is a quote from one of the Ukrainian newspapers, uh, yesterday we received confirmation that our experts will participate in the investigation. Until the investigation is completed, we cannot say for sure which missiles or their parts fell on the territory of Poland, which indicates that uh, he read the room. And yeah. there's a lot of support for Ukraine, and moving on past this is going to be best for basically all parties involved. Yeah, although one, one last thought that popped into my mind, and then we can, we can look at something else, is um, from not, not just from the Ukrainian side, but in, in sort of like general reaction to really bad events. Um, and we've seen this, you know, back at home, you know, in the U S with, uh, you know, I don't know, everything from like a, a celebrity scandal to something as horrible as a school shooting, right? Like the first 24 hours are off almost always wrong in their interpretation because the facts are not out yet. And people will latch on to like one or two data points to, you know, exactly your point of cognitive bias, right? Like, I find something that supports what I want to think anyway. I'm going to latch onto that, you know, like a, you know, uh, like a, like a rabid dog and just not let go uh, because that's what I expected to happen. And it happened. And it's real hard to, to change that message. If you have sort of committed yourself to one particular narrative after that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, certainly, so it's not something we've never seen before, right? It ha happens a lot here back in the States and, probably again keeping in mind like a fog of war and uncertainty it's even in this highly informationized war very hard to know um what's happening at any point um with with 100 percent certainty and, and and we'll see as we then you know maybe think about what's what are scenarios of how the war continues to to develop and evolve is will this provide entree for let's say less decidedly pro-Ukraine politicians in the West to seize upon this issue as a wedge to say, shouldn't we be, um, you know, encouraging or forcing the Ukrainians to contemplate peace negotiations with the Russians? Um, then in essence, the people who want this war to stop and with all the consequences thereof, including Russia locking in additional territorial gains, um, whether this is going to be something that they can seize upon as a way to argue for bringing the war to an end before you russia um is defeated on the battlefield yeah and it goes back to you know we've been talking about watching the clocks various clocks of play here um one of those is how long can you know the 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 western alliances or the western countries that have been providing material support you know how long does that hold together until you know people get tired especially if it's not something you you have your own troops directly committed to um, the uh, the endurance of that is going to be sort of what determines probably the outcome of the overall conflict. And there's, there's always opportunities for sand to get thrown in those gears. Um, you probably don't want to be the one throwing that sand yourself because that right. keeping that clock running as long as possible is what keeps you, you know, keeps you um, effective enough to go after um, set conditions the way you want them on your side. See, I think we we kind of got through the big discussion points we wanted to hit. Um, I I would like to, you know, we we always kind of do our Russian media watch at uh, in a lot of these episodes. So we, I think we talked a little bit about um, the immediate fallout from Hitterson and then the the missile landing in Poland. But has has there been any other sort of messages coming out of the the official Russian media that have been noteworthy lately? Uh, as we talked about, various sources of I wouldn't say pro-Russian per se, but certainly what the Russians are looking for, what they've recognized over the course of this um, conflict. And we talked about a moment ago about the, you know, sand in the gears is um, the Russians have been fairly uh, optimistic that the, the win of the Republicans in the U S house elections, the midterms is going to introduce a lot of us, uh, is going to introduce at least sufficient amounts of skepticism about aid to Ukraine. The Russians effectively understand that Ukraine is a is very popular. Like if that wasn't the case, that you know the Ukraine would not be getting the amount of support that it has been. 
But what they're hoping is that through oversight, through the introduction of, you know, different points in the debate, that the amount and the quality of support from the United States to Ukraine is going to basically be reduced over time. And that is something that they're seizing that they're seizing upon to see that that might be the way that if they can continue basically to just not lose, just put, you know, human wave after human wave to the fight so that it looks like Ukraine is not going to win on the battlefield, given sort of like the capabilities at hand, that that might be the entree for the Russians to have the Ukrainians forced to the negotiating table. So that's what they've been talking about. Um, they've been talking about just the continued, even, you know, several weeks into the mobilization, there's just video after video of mobilized soldiers who don't have the stuff that they need. And the reports that are coming back from the battlefield, you know, that are going onto Russian social media, those are percolating up to the level of television news. And so there's a lot of these confrontations between one guest who says, like, we're not winning, like, I mean, I fully support the special military operation, but we're not seeing the success that we were promised. And the other saying, no, you just need to be patient. You just need to wait for basically like the wonder weapon, the wonder advance, the wonder breakthrough that's going to solve all of these problems all at once. And it's that struggle between, you know, the West is out to get us, the West, the Ukraine is awful, but don't worry, we're going to win. The basically the desire plus the reality, that's the conflict that's being played out on, on these talk shows seemingly on a, on a nightly basis. And so when they have a, a moment, you know, like a little news story or like a news story, such as Zelensky having like an information misstep, this provides them just insane amounts of relief from having to talk about the Russian war effort. And that's in essence where the, the Russian media conversation is at the moment. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I always like to, uh, I know I, I don't keep track of these uh, nearly as many of them, um, but it is it is interesting to see sort of what the current zeitgeist is that comes out of those. Um, they're, uh, they're usually, you know, there's a, usually a level of like sort of quasi apocalyptic stuff going on. But yeah, I guess uh, at least for one more news cycle, at least they have something uh, not as apocalyptic to talk about. So no coverage of the raccoon. No coverage of the raccoon. Which is, I think, evidence of guilt. Probably. We can go ahead and take it that way. Um, okay. Any, uh, see, um, we've actually been fairly disciplined in our time this time. Is there anything else you want to cover before we wrap up? You know, uh, it's it's basically mid-November right now. November 17th uh, is today's date. Um, it hasn't yet gone to co uh, cold weather, um, like super cold weather in terms of thinking about like cold weather operations to so that level yet. Um, which has been useful for Europe in that basically now gas storage is basically at capacity across the continent. So the Russians haven't been able to use um, the gas weapon uh, against Europe as they had previously uh, wanted to do so. But it is something to note for basically what happens over the next couple of weeks when the temperature does start to drop. Are the Ukrainians gonna be able to basically maintain the tempo that they have now? Or are is basically the front line more or less where it's going to be for a period of several months uh, going forward. So that's definitely something, let, let's say when we talk next week or, or thereafter, we'll have to check into, is basically cold weather an impediment to Ukrainian advances or not? Yeah, so, something, I mean, that that is probably the key question over in the coming months. And uh, I know, so it, it, it's not super cold there yet, but I think uh, there were um, people noting it was the first snowfall in Kyiv today or yesterday and there were some pictures floating out there so you know the conditions are starting to get get colder um and it's uh it's only going to get you know frostier as we go into the coming months um yeah i i think it is the big question over the the next several weeks in the next couple months and I think we've talked about it before like there are militarily it is harder to do operations in the cold although it's not impossible especially if you have the right training and the right you know, personal, um, you know, personal protective equipment in terms of clothing and things like that, um, you know, but it is harder um, militarily. That said, there there can be compelling political reasons to conduct uh, a winter campaign 
you know, I'm potentially for both sides, right? Although arguably uh, Ukraine probably has more incentive to try and conduct it. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, start making, making strong assertions, but I, I, I'd be willing to put greater than 50, 50 odds that they will try and continue for momentum in the winter months, even though it may be harder because they don't have the luxury of letting, I, I'm not trying to do wordplay here. They don't have the luxury of letting the conflict get frozen to the point where the second you stop moving forward, that's where the line is drawn and that's not what they want. So I would, I'd be, you know, greater than 50, 50, we're going to see continued offensive operations uh, into the cold, the cold months here. That's right. Jalo's and, and, personal opinion. No, and, and certainly like on on the other side of the on the other side of the front line there is if if the fighting sort of peters out, the Russians will then be able one to start to retrain, regroup, uh, rearm themselves uh, and so forth. And then it becomes relatively less clear as to when the conflict ends because Russia just is a much bigger country. So they just have more resources, even if it's lower quality over the course of this conflict, they'll still just have more of everything, um, people uh, most of all. And then, but as you said, if the Ukrainians keep fighting and they keep making advances, people can then say, well, at this point, it's something like, and I'm just sort of like estimating because I just saw this the other day, Ukraine has reconquered 50% of the territory that Russia took from February 24th onwards. Um, they, you know, they, they've retaken 67% of the territory that Russia has taken and 50% of their overall territory back. If they can continue to move, then it becomes a math problem. Okay, if they took this amount in these various counteroffensives, but they're still moving forward, this conflict should be over or should be obvious that it's going to be over in something like 2023 or 24 and that gives people the opportunity to then assess here's where our uh, support is going to go and so i think it's it's important for the ukrainians to show that they want this war to be over as quickly as possible and it's important for the russians to show they can continue this war for as long as they need yeah so i sorry i lied you cut out there for uh for about 20 seconds right uh, after uh it was yeah. it becomes a math problem yeah, so in terms of it, it comes a math problem. And so what the Ukrainians need to show is if they can continue to fight and take and retake their land, then it one can essentially say, oh, they need to conquer that much more territory. And so therefore they can credibly say with the current rate of external support, we'll have reconquered our land by this date. With more support, we can actually do it in half the time or whatever. So it's you it's in Ukraine's interest to demonstrate that they can end the war on beneficial terms as quickly as possible. And it's in Russia's interest to demonstrate that they can extend this war for as long as they need. And so those are the clocks working in different directions for the Ukrainians and the Russians. Yeah, so I, I do I think we we agree um, some key ones coming up here in the conflict and sort of watch what, what shape that takes for both sides here as temperatures do drop and, do drop and things become become harder on that colder battlefield. Okay, well, um, I think uh, we've we've covered what we wanted to cover today. Um, you've all, thank you again for your time. And uh, for those in the audience, thanks for listening to another Down the Rabbit Hole. I know we we had discussed, and we, we are going to do this on a future episode, having some, uh, some other sort of Team Crew Lack guests in here to talk about other things. We are going to devote an episode to talk about the sort of the reverse arms export chain from uh, from Iran into uh, Russia because they have we've already seen them use the Iranian um, sort of kamikaze drones and there's been reports that we might Iran might start sending some of their their uh, short range ballistic missiles as well as Russian stocks to window you know but uh, interesting dynamic there and you know Russia used to export these things and now they're they're getting these things uh, exported to them because their stocks are dwindling. So we do plan on doing that here um, in the in some point, maybe not the next episode, but once we get the stars to align, we'll get our Middle East studies folks in here to talk about that. And then we are also going to try and do a not necessarily a rabbit hole, but a uh, sort of cross uh, cross competitor survey of nuclear nuclear weapons, nuclear doctrine, 
uh, potential nuclear use cases for not just Russia, but also China and then what, how Iran again might play into that too. So it is coming. Um, but until then, thank you for joining us and make sure you, if you like the episode, please uh, go ahead and give us a response on the survey that we have linked to it. So we know how, uh, if you liked it or if there's things to improve, we can do that. And then also, if you do like it, if you like the videos and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, as well as giving us a good review on our podcast channels, it helps. It helps us information. If you like it, it helps to reach a larger, larger audience if you do that. So, you know, it only takes a couple seconds to hit five stars or hit the like button on the video so that others can benefit from the, the great knowledge that we get from Dr. Weber here every time we sit down. All right. With that, you've all thank you again and uh, have a good weekend and we'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Bye bye.